Hey everyone, Thossy here with First Episode Now, checking out Team 5411 Robo Talons and 9105 Techno Talons here at the Fight Like a Girl and Talon Throwdown competition. These teams are hosting this event, so really excited to walk through both of these guys' robots. 5411 has a really unique arm mechanism and interesting wheels in the middle of their drive base, and 9105 has a combination of an Everybot and a Rev Starter robot, so really excited to walk through this robot here on Behind the Bumpers. This video on fun was brought to you by viewers like you and also by the following. Discover how you can graduate debt-free at Kettering University with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more, schedule a visit, or apply. Fun is continuing to grow and looking for new ad partners for the 2024 season. If your organization has a positive message to spread to our over 250,000 unique viewers, go to firstupdatesnow.com slash contact to get more information. Now, Emery, walk me through your drive base. You have these two special wheels in the center of the robot. Talk yeah. me through all that. So we have a 32 by 32 drive base. And so we have Swerve and we encounter a problem this year. We're like, the charge station can't fit three standard size robots on it. So we decided to have these two driven Colson wheels in the center that theoretically allow us to slide up on the charge station in half on half off. So we have a 16 inch footprint on the charge station. Whereas most like most teams will drive up and drive off the side. Uh, and then, yeah, so we call it a whirve mechanism. So the, this is whirve, this is a swerve. Uh, Love and the naming. A big thing this year was making sure that everything was very intentionally designed. There was nothing that was there just to be there. So our drive base, we have a lot of uh, it holes on one side in the drive base to feed wires through. Everything in the drive base was designed with electronics in mind and making sure, because this is our smallest drive base yet, that we could fit everything. Everything was, you could easily tra trace wires uh, and there was no issues like with that. And then we also have a very high clearance on our bumpers so that when we drop off the side, our bumpers don't pop up and we don't have any issues with ground clearance. Oh, and then we have, so everything that we do, except for we had to replace these bars, these are in-house machined. And then we have these swerve guards that we modified so that they can be handles to lift up the robot. And I think that would be it for my drive base part. All right. Now, Hudson, talk to me about your really unique arm mechanism. You have seems like multiple joints and also, yeah, talk me through your arm. So our arm, we went with a three-stage arm design. And um, you can notice that all of our motors for these are at the bottom, and that helps keep our weight low. And there's just chains driven up and down through the arm. Uh, like Emery said, all of this is custom designed. And all of these arms are independently controlled, so it lets us um, access any point pretty much within the whole front of the robot. And that uh, gives us a lot of unique control over where we can, we so, can place things. So I'm assuming those three Neo motors right there are controlling each of each these stage. chains yes, to each, each stage. of the joints? So okay. yeah, you can see there's the three chains um, that drive each, and it just lowers by one chain because you only have one, you have one less stage. And this intake went through a couple iterations for uh, the design. This is different from the original design we had, which had three wheels on each side, but we noticed that was too long and it was hitting the back of the human player station before we had picked up the, um, the, the cones or the cubes. So we moved this wheel below it so it had more grip on the cubes, but also uh, didn't hit the back of the charge station before we got it. Um, and here we have one pneumatic that's driven by gears on the back, so it can kind of move independently. So when one moves, another moves. And that helps keep, keep this lightweight because it's so far out from the robot. Um, we wanted to keep it as lightweight as we could because it's gonna, all the weight we add increases the torque exponentially. Well, not exponentially, but it increases right. the torque by a lot. Um, on the wheels as well, we have sushi rollers instead of gears. So the, the, the power is transferred um, by these sushi rollers and by the friction of them instead of adding gears, and that's another way we reduce the weight. It's uh, closing and opening is entirely driven by the, uh, the pneumatic. So this is attached on the end right here. When it closes, it opens, and there's these two gears on the back. So when the pneumatic opens this side, it opens the other side. Okay. And when it closes, it's the opposite. We put these green wheels on the back 
in, or on the front instead of the, the blue wheels. And the idea is the, the blue wheels have less, uh, less grip. So we, uh, we use those primarily to hold the cone because there's a lot more compliance with that. And the green wheels are, are kind of stickier. So those are, those are used to keep uh, control of the cubes whenever we intake those. Now let's hand it off to Armand. Talk to me about your programming system that you have with all these joints in mind. Yeah. It seems like you guys have a sensor on your intake as well. Yeah, yeah. So also, yeah, I'll start with the intake. Uh, we wanted to keep it adaptable to both cones and cubes. So we added a banner sensor uh, right here. Uh, we use it for our floor pickup and substation pickup. Uh, and we wanted to have like a common ground for picking up um, all of our game pieces or specifically cones. So once the cone gets detected by the banner sensor, it gets lit up and uh, we just clamp down on it. And we also wanted to keep our game piece secure. Uh, so we always have like a default uh, intake speed going on. So it doesn't try to uh, come out, uh, which ke yeah keeps the cone and cube secure. Um, and yeah, so whenever we uh, get that detected, obviously that closes down, then we're good, we're secured, then we can go full speed um, over to place. And yeah, so if we um, go away to, or we can start with the LED status we have. So back here, we wanted to keep it adaptable with a human player and have um, fast communication. Uh, so we have a yellow for cone and um, purple for cube. And we just have that on our butter board between switching um, cone and cube. And based on that in our code, we have um, different set points in our arm. Um, cube and cone have different set points for different positions. And, and yeah, so if we go into our set points in our arm, uh, we, kept, we kept each joint um, independent of the other. So if we wanted to move one stage, um, the other two stages would remain in their exact same position. Uh, we wanted to keep it just so we have more adaptable scenarios uh, and just be able to get to the set points that some other teams can't get to. Uh, another cool thing about our set points would be, uh, we completely changed our set points from Fort Worth to Amarillo. This robot, uh, we, uh, these two stages were inverts of each other. And the cool thing was, since we have a triple joint, uh, we're able to adapt to these scenarios and all of our um, set points that we have right now are completely different from what we had in our first competition. And yeah, so we also have throughborn quarters to um, measure out our um, exact positions for our set points. And we kept them down there just because we didn't want to account for the gear ratios and have extra math that uh, can cause um, some programming flaws. So we just kept it down there so we can have our most accurate set points. Now, you mentioned about a custom control board. Now, yes. can we talk to Alex? Talk to me about your custom control board that you guys have for your operator. Yeah, so to start with, we have two separate systems. Our driver is going to be using the uh, Xbox controller here to control everything drive-based. We have our button board here to control everything ARM-related. So for our drive controller, it's very simple. It's all the same uh, controls for Swerve is the uh, joysticks. However, because we have new drivers, it's really imperative that we have some extra correction measures in uh, integrated to our controller. So we have our uh, D-pad here as slow uh, strafing, which makes it easier for our new drivers to line up with the grid. We have slow rotation here as well in order to properly line up with the substation. And then with how complex our arm is, we need a really well-made custom button board to come to every single position we need from our arm. So if you look here, we have the left side is all of our positions where we have our high, mid, and low scoring and the different types of pickups all in one area. We get really intuitive to say, all right, it's time to pick up. Let's come to this area and place whichever one we're deciding on. And then we have our cube and cone modes. You can see the LED light changes every time we switch to one of these. And then let's say our positions don't work or our encoders have a fault. We can always switch to manual mode and now we can use the joystick to move the arm wherever we need it to go. And while it is slower, it gets, we made it slow so that even when these aren't working, we still have accurate pickups and placements. We still have other buttons uh, to move our claw up and down and to intake outtake. Um, and the final part of our button board is actually our two switches here. Our first one is the swerve drive, which we talked about here, our uh, horror mechanism. As soon as we flip this, I can flip it here. As soon as we drive side to side in our drive controller, these wheels will spin. We do that so that we're not spinning these wheels while we're driving in competition. It's only spun during the end game when we need them. And then finally, as another backup measure, in case our sensors stop working, let's say our banner sensor, and we come to pick up our cone and it's not closing when it senses the cone, we can flip our switch, which disables all sensors so everything becomes manual control. 
we have all these measures on this button board just like this to make sure if anything goes wrong, we have a backup for it. Now let's move over to your other sister team, 9105 Techno Talons. You guys have a rev starter bot chassis, but with a every bot intake. Now, Aaron, talk me through your design process and how that went on together. All right, so in the beginning of the season, we designed a lot of things. We didn't really come to a great idea that was within the bounds of our team. Um, we wanted to do scoring everywhere and both cones and cubes. So we looked at Rev, Rev's robot, and we figured out that they had they could only score mid and low, right? So through that, we also looked at the EveryBot design and they couldn't pick off the ground. So from there, we looked at them and we went, what if we combine the two? Would that be a better design possibly? And turns out it was, we could score everywhere and pick up everywhere. Um, so as far as the intake goes, uh, this is originally the EveryBot intake. Um, over time, we discovered that having softer wheels here on the intake allowed for a better pickup of the cone game pieces. Um, and then we added these star wheels, which allowed for the cubes to be pulled in effectively as it rotates. Uh, we also lightened it by shoving all the belts on one side and removing an entire plate. Uh, we needed to do that because as we, during our first competition, we discovered that the weight of this intake was quite a bit and would make the robot rock and it would completely shift everything and make it very difficult to control. So we lightened that and that helped a lot with that control issue. Um, so in programming we have this bore encoder, which is relative. And because it's relative, we need a set stop point so that it would always operate the same with those set points that we had. Um, so to do that, we added these green wheels in the back. So we make sure that this, these bars are centered in those green wheels, which makes sure that it is always in the same position at start. Um, and our drive base, it's a standard take. Um, we figured that having more rotation for this game would be a little bit better. So we added Omni wheels to help with the rotation because just having a drop center makes it a bit difficult to turn. Now you, got, you mentioned about your controls. Let's hand it over to Jack C. Talk to me about your electronics. It seems really organized, but also but then afterwards we'll talk about your controls. So talk me through your electronics. Yeah, so when we designed the electronics for this robot, we wanted to design them with both robustness and accessibility in mind. Um, we've had past years where they have not been very accessible or robust. And even in the first competition, a lot of the wires were ripping out and having to be resoldered. So we added a lot of stuff. We added these sleeves to every long wire coming out of the belly pan in order to protect it from the wear and tear of competition. And we also braided the wires inside of the sleeves to reduce the need for zip ties and to make them all go the same length to the same location. We added, um, if you can see them, Wago savers to any Wago connection we made uh, in order to stop them from popping out as they want to do. And for and we added a bunch of protections for the more sensitive electrical components like the RoboRio and the PDH with a light template and 3D printed cover. Um, beyond that though, we wanted our electronics to not only be robust but also um, functional. So in that, in the pursuit of that, we uh, raised the RoboRio from uh, the floor of the belly pan in order to make it closer to the center of gravity of the robot, which would have increased it, it, which would have made it closer to the center of gravity, which would have improved our auto balance functionality. And we also added these LEDs onto the front of the robot, which can tell our human player at a very quick glance whether we want cones 
uh, whether we want cones if they're yellow or cubes if they're purple. And so for our controls. Yeah, it seems like you guys also have a custom controller at like yes. your sister team. We have a custom button board controller setup scheme. Uh, with this, we knew that a two controller setup would have not been enough buttons, enough functionality. So here we have our set point movement. If the operator wants the arm to go to the high node, mid node, low node, um, they also have ground substation pickup. There's an idle mode, which brings it back into the robot for better transit. As we realized in the first competition, it was rocking and flipping if we didn't idle it down into the robot. We have the switcher between the cone and the Q mode. Yes. Uh, we have the switcher between the cone and the Q mode in order to both tell our operator and tell our robot um, what mode it's in. So we also have intake outtake for the intake on the robot. But the coolest thing about the button board here is this sniper mode. It's also included on the controller. It will slow down the it will slow down the arm's movement in order to give us more precise movements, especially with these manual controls here. Um, as as you probably know, um, set points aren't always the most reliable, so we have these manual controls here in case they fail us. Um, and this sniper mode has helped with that. On the controller, it's a pretty standard tank setup with uh, that joystick here moving the robot. But there's also a sniper mode for the drive base in order to better line up with the grid substation and to have a better charge. Now, speaking about our movement and essentially Auton, let's hand it to Jack D. Talk to me about your autonomous and how with the, the arm and the changes you guys have made, how does, how does that work together? All right, so this year, since it was our first year, we decided to do a very simple timed Auton. Basically, uh, during autonomous, it runs a set of commands based on timeouts. Timeouts basically say how long a command can run. So for instance, uh, for our most common Auton, which is score, cone high, and mobility, um, it brings the arm up to the cone high position. Uh, it spits out um, a cone after about two seconds, retracts the arm, and then drives backwards for the mobility point for about another I believe four seconds. We have multiple autons, about, I believe we have six. Um, so it allows us to be very versatile. Uh, one of our most prominent autons is the score cone, mobility, and balance, where we do all of those, but we also have an uh, auto engage feature so we can auto balance when our other teammates don't have one. Um, overall, it's a pretty basic design. We do have one major change for the arm though. We have an auton arm command which essentially A, moves the arm a bit faster since we know the arm isn't going to be jostling around a lot, and B, um, when you're selecting the game mode, you don't have to rely on button inputs. It just We just feed that value directly in there. Is it possible that we can see your autonomous? Yeah, sure. So this auton is going to be cone mobility. OK. So I assume this is your starting position with the cone? Yep. We always start from this position. All right, enabling. And I assume that driving was to balance the robot. On the uh, no, this one is pass? just this is one's just to get mobility. Okay. So when we do our auto balance one, we score a cone high and we drive backwards off of the auto engage station to get the mobility point, and then we drive forward a little bit and then enact our auto engage command. All right. Well, Robo Talons and Techno Talons, really excited to see you guys perform at this offseason that you guys are hosting again. Thank you so much to walking through us between both of y'all's robots. And again, congratulations on the great success you guys had this season and really excited to see what you guys do next season. Good luck, guys. This video on fun was brought to you by viewers like you and also by the following. Discover how you can graduate debt-free at Kettering University with Kettering's amazing co-op employment programs. Those accepted into Kettering University can apply for a robotic scholarship providing up to an additional $5,000 a year in tuition assistance. Head on over to kettering.edu slash first to learn more, schedule a visit, or apply. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell to stay up to date on our new videos. Keep the conversation going and provide your input to our content. Most live shows can be found on the First Updates Now YouTube channel, live competitions at twitch.tv slash firstupdatesnow, and join our Discord at discord.gg slash firstupdatesnow. Check our other social offerings on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter.